James here, and for today's talk, we're going to be going over what you need to know about RV dry camping or boondocking or mooch docking, whatever you want to call it, and how to do it right. Now, this is the fifth episode in my RV basic series for beginners, which is sponsored by our friends at Winnebago RVs. Winnebago wants to make sure you have the information you need so you can get out there and jump right into RVing without any difficulty. But, and this is an important point, the information we'll be covering here is not Winnebago specific. Literally anyone with any RV can use this information to get out there and get dry camping. So a big thank you to Winnebago and let's get started. All right, we're here to talk about all the various forms of dry camping, but what exactly do I mean by dry camping? Let's start there. Dry camping is a broad term for whenever you're somewhere overnighting in your RV without being hooked up. So maybe you're parked for the night at a Walmart as you're making your way across country. Or maybe you're boondocking in the desert off a gravel road in Nevada. Or maybe you're just overnighting in your family's driveway in Minnesota. No matter how you do it, as long as you're not hooked up in any way, no power, no fresh water, no dump post connected, that's dry camping. It's actually one of the coolest things about having an RV. You can sleep in it anywhere and you don't need hookups. It's the whole reason Steph and I got our first RV 13 years or so ago now. We wanted to sleep overnight right at the start line at weekend cycling events, which if you've ever participated in any, you know they always start way too early in the morning and in the cold and with not enough port johns for all the nervous, coffee-filled, shivering riders. So we got into RVing because of dry camping, and we've been doing it for a long time now. But starting lines aren't the only place you can dry camp. Now, there are no official definitions here, but generally speaking, there are four kind of main ways RVers dry camp. The first is the one that lets you fill your Instagram account with photos that'll make all your friends jealous. Boondocking. Now, you've probably all heard the term boondocking, or maybe you've just heard it called wild camping or dispersed camping. These terms are all roughly synonymous and they're used to describe any time you're dry camping somewhere on public land outside of a designated campground and away from any amenities. Boondocking, that's the dream, right? People see these gorgeous pictures of RVs in the middle of nowhere, it's very scenic, and it looks like they're the only people on the planet. And that's what sells so many people on RV life. Another common dry camping option is parking lots. It's nowhere near as pretty as boondocking, but if you're in the middle of a long drive and you're pulling in at 10 p.m. at night and you just need a night's sleep before hitting the road again at 6 a.m. in the morning, parking lots get the job done. Now, Steph and I do a surprising amount of overnighting in parking lots because we tend to do a lot of long drives. Now, if that parking lot is a Walmart, you might hear it called Wally docking. Uh, there's a handful of states that allow overnighting at their rest areas. And there are other businesses that may allow overnighting in their parking lots too. These are like Cabela's, Bass Pro Shops, Cracker Barrel, Truck Stops, and various casinos. It's never a given though, and whether or not it's allowed depends on store management and local laws and ordinances. Now you can even dry camp at RV campgrounds and RV parks. Lots of our favorite public campgrounds have no hookups at all, so that's dry camping. And even if you're at a private RV park and a site has hookups, but you don't use them, you're technically dry camping. Now there's also something called mooch docking, and that's pretty much any time you're staying in a friend's or acquaintance's driveway or somewhere on their property, because you, know, you get it, you're being a mooch, right? So we've got lots of RV friends who swing by our house and mooch dock, and it works out great for everyone. They're still visiting, but they've got their own space and we can all get a break from each other every once in a while. Although why anyone would need a break from me, I can't imagine. Anyway, all kinds of definitions there, but if you're really new, you might be asking, yeah, but like how? Like physically, how do I dry camp? Is there a switch I flip or is there some paperwork I have to file or something like that? And the answer to those questions will pleasantly surprise you because there's just about nothing you need to do. In fact, I'd say that dry camping is even easier than camping in an RV park because you don't have to worry about hooking anything up. So when you're dry camping, you're not going to be hooking up to campground water. Instead, your water is going to come from your RV's onboard storage tank. So make sure that's got clean water in it. And you'll need to use your RV's onboard pump to move that water from the tank around where your various fixtures are. So make sure you know how to turn your RV's water pump on and off. Electrical power, when you're dry camping, will come from your RV's battery, or batteries. 
That will be where you get 12 volt power for the lights and such. Now any 120 volt power will need to come from either a generator or an inverter. And the inverter ultimately draws power from your batteries, so we're again back around to your battery bank. So if you know how to start your generator, if you have one, or turn on your inverter, if you have one, and you know how to check your battery capacity, then you're all set on the electrical front. Now, wastewater will just go into your holding tanks like normal until you find someplace suitable to dump it. So when you're going dry camping, it's a good idea to start off with empty waste tanks. And that's kind of it, really. Just use your RV. You know, if you're cold, turn on the heater. If you're hot, turn on a fan. If you want a cold drink, go get one out of the fridge. You know, every RV we've ever run across is capable of at least basic dry camping, giving you a place to sleep overnight. So you should be good to go without too much fuss. All right, we've talked about the various ways to dry camp, and now you know it's not actually that hard to actually do. So that leads to this question. How do you find places to dry camp? And that is often harder to do than the actual camping itself. And you do want to get that right because no one wants like an angry knock on their door at 3 a.m. telling them to get lost or the police to give you a ticket for breaking some sort of city parking ordinance. So how do you avoid that? Well, what Steph and I mostly do is we turn to our favorite apps. There are loads of apps to find dry camping spots, so do your homework, test out a bunch, and see what you prefer. For us, if we're looking for a scenic boondocking site, we'd start with iOverlander. If we were going on a long drive and wanted a quick parking lot right on our route, we'd open overnight RV parking first. And if we wanted like an actual campground, which may or may not have hookups, we'd open up something like Campendium or Allstays or the recreation.gov app. Quick word about the overnight RV parking app. It's been one of our go-to apps for years, but at the end of December, 2023, they're decommissioning that app apparently and rolling it into Road Trippers. Hopefully things will work the same when they're in Road Trippers, but I suppose that remains to be seen. So how about a hypothetical example? Let's say Steph and I have decided we're gonna head out from our home here in Southern Utah, and we want to go see the ghost town of Rhyolite, Nevada. That's about three and a half hours away. Okay, cool. So to figure out where we're going, we'd start with iOverlander. Because of our three apps, we know that one tends to have the best selection of boondocking style sites. All right, so iOverlander shows you a map and then you zoom in on the area you're interested in. So now that I've kind of done that, you can see I've got a bunch of options around here. I've got, you know, some of them have photos that I can look at. Okay, thank you, that's very nice. I can check out reviews from people who have stayed there before. Now with iOverlander, the more good reviews you see, and especially the more recent reviews, the better your chances are for not getting asked to move in the middle of the night. But do be aware that anyone can add spots to iOverlander. They're not vetted and you're not even guaranteed they're legal or suitable for your RV. So read the reviews carefully, caveat emptor, judge for yourself. Anyway, iOverlander is giving me all sorts of options uh, right around Rhyolite. Um, good, here's one, it's not too far away, it's right on our route, Vanderbilt Pond. It's got lots of reviews, there's wild burrows apparently, okay, cool. Next, to see what my options are, I'll open my overnight RV parking app, and at least through the end of 23 I will. And uh, looking around Rhyolite, I get only one green option. There are two red options, and those are telling me places where overnighting is not allowed. So checking the one green option, I get a casino parking lot. It kind of says it charges a fee, but I guess that could be fun if we're in that sort of mood. And then let's check out Rhyolite on Campendium. Now, the blue and red icons show RV parks, and the green shows either boondocking or campgrounds on public lands. Checking out the green, I get Bombo's Pond, which is a different name, but it looks like the same boondocking spot that I had found before on iOverlander. Uh, reading the reviews the pond seems nice. There again with the wild burrows, I think that's probably the same place. So I think that's a spot for us. And so that's how it sort of works for us to find a camping spot. Now, I wish I could tell you you only needed one app and it's as easy as that. But it's been our experience that the different apps have slightly different suggestions for any area, so it's better to kind of consult at least a couple of them so you can make the best choice for you. But even if you do your research, things do happen. You might get there and the place might be completely filled up or the road might be closed off or it might be too muddy or just plain too hazardous to get through. So unless you have actual reservations somewhere, it's always smart to have a backup plan 
or two. We end up on plan B or even plan C pretty regularly. So the best advice I can give you when you're headed out boondocking is to plan to have your plans change. Like everything with RVing, you've got to stay flexible. And a final tip for finding awesome boondocking sites are RV Facebook groups. Steph keeps our own personal list of locations that people have shared on the various Facebook groups that we're in. And that's actually how we found some of our coolest and most awesome boondocking sites. So keep an eye out for those and maybe start your own personal boondocking bucket list. Okay, so we've covered the different ways you can dry camp and then the how to do it and how to find places to dry camp. So now let's get into some general tips that will make things go as smoothly as possible your first few times out. The first and perhaps the biggest tip is to do your research ahead of time. And yes, that feels like it flies in the face of the whole, the road is calling and I must go kind of ethos, but you don't want to get you know, arrested by a ranger for lighting a campfire where you shouldn't. So a bit of research up front kind of makes sense. Now, living out west, we're very familiar with regulations on fires, and we certainly don't want to be the ones to start the next mega wildfire. So you'll want to check out those rules beforehand. But that's not the only thing you should check out. There may be rules on generator hours or even whether they're allowed at all. And that could be true even if you're not staying in a developed campground. Also, at most every campground we've seen, there are limits on how long you can stay at one time. And there may be permits required, even though the camping itself might be free, you still could have to have a permit. So be sure to check on that. Again, planning is the big key to success here. Now, another tip, especially as you're just figuring out how to do this, is to try to go during milder weather. Why? Because it's a lot easier to camp without hookups if you don't have to run your air conditioner 24 by seven, right? Now, third tip is one I wish we remembered to do ourselves more often or even ever, it seems like. If you're arriving at a site that you've not been to before, particularly if it requires any kind of off-road navigating, arrive during the daytime. It's a heck of a lot easier to figure out, can I make that if you can actually see that? So you'll smack into a lot fewer low-hanging branches arriving during daylight. Don't ask me how I know this. That's the tip. Okay. Here's one, if it's dry camping, you're not making reservations for these places, right? It's all first come, first serve. Essentially, you're competing with everybody else to get into that spot. So if you can, try arriving on like a Wednesday or a Thursday to beat the weekend crowds. Because like, if you wanna stay at one of those cool on the river spots near Moab and you arrive at 7 p.m. on a Friday night, I'm pretty sure you're not gonna get a site. So kind of along those same lines, since we are talking about first come, first serve sites here, there's no camp host or friendly ranger around to maintain order. So if you're like in a class B camper van and you drive out of your site to go into town for dinner or something, don't count on that site being there when you get back. Now we know RVers who travel with cones or other items, they can leave at a campsite to try to indicate it's you know reserved. But we've had rugs stolen from our campsite so I wouldn't put my trust in an abandoned lawn chair being able to hold on to our site for us. To avoid disappointment, it's best to think of leaving your site as leaving. Um, leveling blocks or some other means of achieving level. Now, personally, I'm kind of berserk about getting the RV level, but even if you're pretty loose with it, some of these off-grid sites are pretty darn unlevel, right? So much so that you might have a difficult time even using your RV if you don't have a way to at least get it somewhat closer to level. We've been in some sites where unless we leveled, the water wouldn't even go down a drain properly. So do consider that. Garbage, kind of a, a bummer to think about, but plan out what you're gonna do with your garbage because these sites don't usually have dumpsters at them. There are no attendants coming around every day to gather up your trash. Most of the time, it's up to you to pack out your own trash. And the longer you stay, the more trash you're going to create. So take a few minutes to think about what you're gonna do with your garbage before you go. This is particularly important in bear country because you can't just leave garbage in a plastic bag outside your RV. And finally, groceries. Now, obviously, if your dry camping adventures will have you staying in a Walmart parking lot, then you don't have to give too much thought to groceries, right? But if you're headed into the back country for a week, you're going to need to plan that out because breaking camp because you're out of toilet paper? Well, that's not really gonna make anyone very happy. And remember, if you have to go back to the grocery store, there's a chance your site might not be there by the time you get back, right? Now, etiquette. 
In an ideal world, what I'm about to say here would be just a matter of course and it would be second nature to everyone. But unfortunately, we know that's just not true. We've had dry camping experiences spoiled by most of the things I'll talk about on this slide. But if we'd all just keep these things in mind, then everyone will have the opportunity to have a much better time when dry camping. And the first of these is spread out. If you've driven 30 miles from the nearest town to the edge of a canyon in the middle of nowhere, and there's just one other RV out there for as far as you can see in any direction, please realize that they probably didn't drive all the way out there to be parked six feet away from strangers. So be respectful, keep your distance. The best way I can describe what this feels like will mostly make sense to the men listening. And this actually happened to be once, late at night in the Atlanta airport. Imagine you walk into an empty public men's room and there's a line of 21 urinals. You, being a sane person, select your own number 21. Or one, one is also an acceptable answer. If another lone individual comes into the restroom and sidles up directly next to you at urinal number 20, well, that's just plain creepy, right? Like the hairs in the back of your neck will stand up and you'll start sweating because you get the feeling that something bad is about to go down, right? So, when you're wild camping, don't be that guy at the urinal. There are lots and lots of urinals out there to pick from, so please be respectful and pick the urinal that gives everyone the most space possible. Urinal rules apply. And I don't know if women have the same kinds of rules. Do they? Y'all have stalls, right? Same kind of... Anyway, the next etiquette tip is sort of related to that last one, and that's to please keep your pets in your area. Your dog may be super friendly, but not everybody knows that. Once, when we were dry camping on Mount Shasta, we were basically held captive inside our rig because the urinal guy who parked right next to us let his aggressive dog run loose and it would charge us, snarling every time we stepped out of the rig. So here's a picture of what it looked like when we parked earlier in the day but I don't have a picture of the urinal guy who came in later to park next to us because we literally could not exit our RV to take a picture. We wound up leaving our leveling blocks on the mountain because we could not get out to retrieve them. We didn't particularly enjoy that. And I'm pretty sure most other folks wouldn't like it either. So please give everyone the opportunity to enjoy the experience in their own way and realize that their way probably doesn't include you or your pets. Okay. The next tip is more for established campsites, and I guess we're talking about campsites that don't have any hookups since we're talking about dry camping. But if you roll into a campground, even if there's nobody else around, please just pay for it, either with the envelope and the drop box by the entrance, you know, or these days a lot of times through online sites and a QR code. I mean, sure, it may look deserted, no harm, no foul, right? But if there's an online system, then maybe somebody has reserved the site online and just nobody has put out the reserved sign yet. And yes, that's happened to us too. Rolled in late, had to knock on another RV's door to ask them to leave our site. Just awful for everyone involved. There aren't really a whole lot of rules at remote campgrounds, so do make an effort to figure out what few rules there are and abide by them. And that includes paying for the sites when that's required. Don't be a squatter. It just makes it uncomfortable for everyone. If you're not camping in an isolated location, do be considerate with your outdoor music. Steph and I can't even agree on what, if any, music we should be playing in our own RV. So negotiating that with a stranger while we're both standing next to a cliff, well, that hardly seems smart. <laughs> Back to the rules thing. If there are generator hours, please do obey those. But even if there aren't generator hours literally spelled out, just be considerate with your generator use if there are other folks around. Leave no trace, obviously. Um, don't leave your trash. Don't remove parts of the landscape to take them with you, even if they are really cool. Don't dig up vegetation or take a bunch of rocks or something or make a path for your RV, that sort of thing. And along with leave no trace, I'll throw in leave no contents from your gray tank on the ground. And if you watch RVing groups, every once in a while, someone will suggest this, just dumping your gray water on the ground. And that usually starts a free-for-all free -for pile-on kind of anger fest that goes on for weeks and weeks until it eventually dies down, until the next person suggests it. So I'm just here to tell you, just don't. Sure, there may be nothing in your gray tank, but maybe a little dirty dishwater. But even if it eventually evaporates or whatever, it's going to leave the site an awful mess for the next RVer who comes along right after you. No one wants to set up camp in your wastewater. So please just don't do that. And 
While these are good tips for dry camping in remote locations, there are some additional courtesies you should observe if you're going to be lot docking. Now remember, lot docking, in this scenario, you're just parking overnight in a business's parking lot. So not only do you need to be courteous to the other RVers around, your fellow campers, you need to be courteous to the business owner as well so that they don't wind up regretting their decision to allow RVs to stay in the parking lot. Because if they wind up regretting it, then we could all lose that option for a place to stay. So the first tip here is to always ask first. Sure, it may be a Walmart and there could be other RVs already in the lot, but it's just common courtesy to ask. Maybe they're expecting snow and there's this one part of the lot where they push all the piled snow to, right? Or maybe they're restriping part of the parking lot starting at 6 a.m. You just don't know unless you ask. And it doesn't have to be like a big formal application, right? So don't sweat it, just head inside, locate a responsible individual and ask them something like, hey, we're passing through an RV and we're hoping it would be okay to sleep for the night in your parking lot. And they will most likely say something like, sure, no problem, or thanks for asking, or okay, but please park on the east side of the store because we have a bunch of 18 wheelers headed to our loading dock in the morning. If nothing else, you'll sleep better. Like you will literally get a better night's sleep knowing you have permission to be there from someone. Okay, next tip for lot docking is to park out of the way. Common sense there, and if you followed the first tip, then you likely have an idea of just what out of the way means at that particular parking lot. And the next one is one we shouldn't have to say, but I'm saying it, lot docking is not camping. And it's not even tailgating, so don't throw out your patio rugs, lawn chairs, barbecue grills, fencing for your dog, light up flamingos, whatever. The parking lot at the Flying J is just a place you can sleep. It's not a destination. Going further down that not camping road, try to limit your stays to one night. Nobody signed over the deed to that parking space to you, so spend your night and, and move on. And if you can, not possible in every rig, but if you can, try to leave your slides in. In other words, it's more considerate of you to take up one parking space instead of three. And finally, do make an effort to patronize the business in some way as a thank you for them giving you a free place to spend the night. This is why they allow it. So like at a truck stop or a travel center, that's, that's pretty easy. Just go buy some gas, right? At a Cracker Barrel, just go eat breakfast. You get the idea. We want to make these businesses glad that they allowed our viewers to spend the night. Okay, this next segment is more for boondocking or wild camping, not so much for parking lot stays. Let's say you've tried it and you like it, it's your jam, fantastic. Now, if you're only going out for a day or two, that's easy, pretty much all, our, all RVs can handle a couple days off grid without too much issue, as long as you're not like running the air conditioner or some other high draw appliance. But staying out longer than that couple of days is, is going to require you to more actively manage your resources, like water and power. So let's talk about the things you'll want to pay attention to if you want to dry camp for longer stretches. And as we do this, you'll find that your approach to, to how you dry camp is gonna put you somewhere along a continuum. On one end of the spectrum, you have RVing practices that are super comfortable and convenient, maybe even just what you do at home. But those practices tend to use more of your resources to get you that comfort and convenience. At the other end of the spectrum, there are RVing practices that are super conservy and that would allow you to stay out for a really long time, but those tend to be less convenient and less comfortable. Now there's not one right or wrong answer to where you need to be on that continuum. Everyone will need to figure that out for themselves. How much comfort or convenience are you willing to forego in order to stay out in the boonies for longer? It's your decision. Is not breaking camp for an extra couple days really worth showering outside in a bucket so that you can capture the runoff? I can answer that for us, but I can't answer that for you, so you'll need to weigh those things out yourself. So what we'll do here is I'll just give you some tips so you can think about these things in three different areas, fresh water, wastewater, and power and electricity. And you can decide for yourselves how far down the road you're willing to go. Let's start with fresh water. And the first tip is beginner level stuff. Wherever you're headed, arrive with your fresh water tank full and also your wastewater tanks empty. Common sense stuff, right? The more water you have, the longer it will last. But if you do that and you find that you're still running out of water before you're ready to leave, then you can always look to bring along more water. So there are collapsible water bladders that will let you bring along more. Like if your fresh tank holds 30 gallons and you bring along an extra 10, 
well then you've just increased your off-grid time by 33%, right? And the collapsible ones, by the way, are really the way to go here because once you've emptied them, then they don't take up a whole lot of space. But eventually, there's kind of a practical limit as to how much extra water you can bring. So if you can't increase the supply any further, then you need to reduce the demand. So if you want to take it to the next level, you'll need to look at ways to use less water. There are a lot of things you do in the RV that use water, but generally the biggest water consumers in the RV are showering, washing dishes, hand washing, and cooking. Now, as far as showering, there are a variety of things listed here, and we've tried most of them at one time or another. The Navy shower thing is pretty much a standard. You know, you turn on the water to get wet, then turn it off, wash yourself up, and then turn the water back on to rinse off. I think most RVers probably do that to some extent, at least some of the time. Using campground showers or showers at a gym, those are things we do from time to time. And the suggestions go on from there. Limit hair washing or limit hair, in my case. There are a number of things you can try depending on how far you want to push it, but baldness as a water saving strategy I don't necessarily recommend. Now, for washing dishes, you could bring along disposable plates and cutlery. That's not super green, but it certainly cuts down on dishwashing at the expense of creating more garbage that you then have to manage. I'm not aware of disposable pots and pans, so you'd still have to wash those, but you could look at alternative ways to cooking, like grilling or griddling. Those typically don't require pots and pans. Now, as far as hand washing goes, there's not much getting around it completely. I mean, you should still wash your hands, right? I mean, you could look to use hand sanitizer some of the time to avoid washing your hands quite so much, but I'm not gonna stand here and tell you not to wash your hands. For the record, still wash your hands. But again, you can do the turn the water on and off hand washing thing. Is that Navy hand washing? Is that a thing? Anyway, now cooking. If you're really trying to conserve water, you're probably not going to make a big terrine of soup, right? But even things like washing vegetables to cook. You might look to do as much of that ahead of time as you can and just pack pre-washed vegetables. Like I said before, you could look at alternative ways of cooking that will help reduce the pots and pans there. You could even go as far as this as you want and do cold or raw foods, I suppose. But don't go as far as I did on a Grand Canyon trip back in my youth and bring along only sandwiches and power bars. Sure, I used no water for cooking or cleaning and the like, but at the end of day three, nobody wants a three-day-old sandwich or another power bar. It's like the choices you get to make in food hell. Now, as far as your wastewater tanks go, you do need to pay attention to these because a full waste tank will make you leave your spot just like an empty freshwater tank will. There is some good news here though because, generally speaking, the things you're doing to conserve freshwater will also conserve great tank space. So, reducing the number of dishes you wash, shorter navy showers, etc., those save freshwater and great tank space as well. You could, if you were really dedicated, Look at capturing your used water for other purposes. It's obviously no good as clean water, but you could use it for something like flushing your toilet, right? That's easy enough. Just wash your dishes in a dish pail, and then instead of dumping that water down the drain, use it to flush the commode. That saves both fresh water and gray tank space. Now, saving space in your black tank. The obvious tip here is to use other toilets if they're available. So if there's a pit toilet or something nearby, go for that but if there is no other toilet available, you'll be tempted to use very little water when flushing your toilet. Be careful with that. If you saw the wastewater video in this series, the one thing I hope you remember from it is that water is your friend, right? You won't cause a black tank problem by using too much water, but you sure can cause one by not using enough. So if you find yourself tempted to flush with very little water, be very careful about that. You don't want to create a super concentrated sludge in your black tank. You just won't like how that ends up. But now you could do something like put used toilet paper in a separate receptacle. That does save space in your blank tank. It keeps things more liquid and it doesn't wind up being as gross as it sounds first off. And finally, just like you can add capacity to your fresh water by bringing along additional water, you can add capacity to your black or gray tanks by bringing along an external portable waste tank to dump in place. Just, you know, be mindful of the capacities. Like, if you've got a 25-gallon black tank, don't try to dump that into a 20-gallon portable tank. All right, now let's talk about power conservation. When you're dry camping, 
you won't be hooking up to the grid to get electricity. It's all going to be whatever you've brought with you in your batteries or whatever you can generate on site with a generator or solar power. That's it. So if you want to stretch things further, you're going to be looking for ways to conserve. Now, generators are the most common ways RVers produce power when they're dry camping. They do consume fuel, so you'll be limited by how much fuel you can bring. They also make noise, and that leads some camping spots to limit the hours that they can be used. So be aware that you might run into that. And even if there are no regulations about the hours that generators are allowed, they're just kind of sort of loud, and nobody really likes listening to them. But the good news for generators is that while they're running, they are both powering your 120 volt loads, that's something like an air conditioner or a microwave or an induction cooktop, they'll also be charging your house battery bank. Now, as far as ways to conserve, you'll likely want to avoid as much as you can the high draw 120 volt appliances. That's things of the regular household plugs. So air conditioners, microwaves, hair dryers, electric space heaters, K-cup machine, welder, bandsaw, whatever. Those all tend to use a lot of power. So like, instead of the air conditioning, see if you can get the job done with fans. They use just a fraction of the power, and many of them are 12 volts, so you won't need a generator or an inverter in order to run a fan. If you have an older RV, try updating your lighting to LED lighting. They use less power than traditional incandescent lighting, and LED bulbs today are a lot more available than they were like 10 years ago. And finally, we've come to my favorite power thing, mods. And power is one place where there are lots of opportunities to make mods that will keep you out in the field for longer. You could add additional battery capacity. Been there, done that. You could add an inverter so that you could use that battery to generate 120 volt power without running your generator. And you could add solar capacity to your rig to help keep your battery charged up. All of those are possible, but here is a money-saving tip for you. Before you rush out and start adding battery capacity or more solar capacity or whatnot, not that it isn't fun, I've done plenty of that, but before you go there, try some camping first and see where you really are hitting your limits, right? It could be that you have plenty of battery power, but fresh water is the thing that ends your trip. So I always recommend trying things first and then spending your money where you actually hit your limits, not just where you think you might hit your limits. And finally, if you really dig the dry camping thing and you want to do more of it, there are a number of RV features that make it a lot easier. So when it comes time to select your next RV, maybe you want to prioritize these features when you're picking out a rig. So let's take something like large holding tanks. Our Winnebago Echo can carry 50 gallons of fresh water and 50 gallons of gray water. That's kind of enormous for a small RV and it will get you out there a long time before you'll need to dump and fill. Now, battery capacity. Sure, you can mod it on your own, and I've done that, but it requires time and know-how. It sure is easier when things just come off the shelf with the battery capacity you want, right? The same could be said for a large inverter or a sizable solar setup. Both of those can be big benefits from dry camping, and it's just a lot easier if you don't have to do them. Now, insulation is one area where we haven't touched on in this video yet, but generally speaking, a better insulated RV will require less energy to maintain a comfortable temperature. Therefore, it's easier on your resources and it will help you stay out there for longer. And insulation works both ways, right? It keeps you cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. And if you want to get way, way out there, not just parking in your family's driveway, then you'll need to pay attention to things like length, width, wheelbase, ground clearance, whatnot. That's one of the reasons why something like the Winnebago Revel is so popular. Well, there you have it. A whole bunch of tips for dry camping. Now you know what it is. You know, basically, how to do it. You know you can do it with literally any RV. You know how to find places to dry camp, how not to annoy your neighbors when you get there, and how you might try to stay out there for longer. There will be a post over on thefitrv.com linked in the video description down below. So if you have any questions or comments, hop on over there and we'll try to get them answered for you. From us and from our friends at Winnebago RVs, see you out there dry camping. Thank you.